Did anybody have any question about? Yes. Very good. Yes. So, firstly, one of the things that I'd like to say is that the explanation of the sutta has been one of the best that I've ever heard. Uh -huh. uh, I've been, uh, been writing the instructions of Pana Pana for, for many, many years now. I think it has been more than eight to nine years now. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I've also read this uh, sutta many times, but I haven't uh, really managed to understand it earlier really to me. So, Many, many thanks for that. So, uh, uh, and I think one of the things that uh, uh, really struck me was what you said about how, uh, about how, how this Panapana Sati Sutta actually seems to explain what you go of the uh, Sati Pratana Sutta. And that really seemed to make a lot of sense. I had a few things to ask about this. So, uh, so essentially in the first part of it, we speak about the four resting places of uh, awareness and in the second part of it, we speak about uh, you know, using these how you develop the supports of awakening. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, even in that, we've got four sections. One is about body is body, then the other, uh, then the other is about uh, sensations. Uh -huh. Then you have it about the mind and the mind objects. Uh -huh. Do you do all four of these resting places of uh, awareness at the same time for these uh, 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 seven uh, supports of uh, awakening? Was it, uh, because it just seems very sort of uh, overwhelming to, uh, you know, to actually have one's uh, 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 to do all of these uh, seven to four things at the same time. Or uh, is it like, uh, Mm, yes. So it, it's hard to explain, you know, a kind of a three-dimensional concept into a linear, like, word sentence. Um, so these these things, they are really, you know, it's it's alive basically. So they are. Um, they are principles that uh, we apply and that uh, work their way uh, in a kind of a... And that's why it's development, basically. So this is like the whole kind of... the algorithm that needs to happen for liberation, basically. Um, and we're not trying to focus uh, on any particular thing. It, basically, that's, that's what I love about this sutta in particular, is that you know, the, the Buddha gives this sequence of anapanasati, which basically is the seven supports of awakening, how to just develop them like every breath. That's, what, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, and then he says, he says, because he's always trying to tie it in to the bigger picture of his teaching, basically. He says, well, and when you do that, you're practicing the four satipatthanas properly. You know, you, at any part of this, it's not that we need to focus on these bits or to be aware like, oh, now I'm, now I'm aware of the body because I'm aware of my whole body and I'm releasing the tension. So this is bodily awareness and then I'm switching to sensations because I'm with the joy and no this is this is all together and this is why I, I love this particular teaching is that it's quite obvious that this is really organic you know this is really uh, you know because when you look at this with an absorption concentration kind of mind, yes, you're trying to like box it into like these really like tight boxes that can't move and like pour concrete into that and that's it. But that's just not the way it works really. Um, this, uh, all the satipatthanas, you know, like uh, the, the four resting places of awareness, they're, they kind of work together at, at when are you exactly with the Dhamma principles? When are you exactly with sensations? 
when are you exactly with mind, that's all up to you. It's all a matter of your own understanding and perception. What matters is that basically you see reality for what it is. That's all the Satipatthanas mean, really. It's dependent origination without the craving uh, upward uh, uh, part to it. So it's like a clean, it's a, it's a clean dependent origination. <laughs> Maybe like a reverse way of putting it is like try to be present and like not be aware of your body, not be aware of your mind, not be aware of the sensations happening or the mental activities and, and uh, phenomena. All those things are happening on their own. You know, dependent origination is happening constantly at every moment. So if you're present, you're, those things are, ha are uh, showing themselves to you on their own. So essentially the insight that I have is that uh, it is our mental collectiveness which is around these four uh, resting places of uh, awareness. And uh, you know, all of the rest about uh, uh, seven supports is more of the roadmap that has been shown that this is what is going to get up on the planet. Yes. So another thing I had to ask that uh, you had made, uh, made one passing mention of the fact that uh, there's essentially these four foundations of uh, mindfulness uh, uh, linked with uh, uh, dependent origination minus the part beyond uh, uh, the uh, craving. Yes. Uh, would you just, just be able to explain that? Yes, that the four found the four satipatthanas, the four resting places of awareness, are dependent origination without the craving. Is that what the question was? Okay. So basically, uh, what are the four foundations of uh, awareness? Is uh, the four resting places of awareness is body as body, uh, sensations as sensations, uh, mind as mind, and dhamma principles as dhamma principles. So. Body is, uh, in the, uh, dependent origination, body is rupa. Na, nama rupa. Nama rupa is that kind of uh, rupa and salayatana, the six senses. Like I kind of explained on day three, I made that kind of bridge. Um, so rupa and salayatana are both what basically what body is. Uh, and then, uh, and I would even put contact into that, basically. Uh, and then you have uh, Vedana, which is obviously sensations. Uh, and then uh, you have mind, which is uh, consciousness and uh, Nama, basically, of the Nama Rupa. And you have uh, Dhamma principles, which, I mean, this is kind of like... Uh, all of it, basically. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I. It could it could fall into that that category. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess it, it could be formations. Yeah. And so the the four satipatthanas are basically um, because in in the chain of dependent origination uh, you have these elements that you can't really do anything about, which is those, those four satipatthanas, basically. You can't do anything about consciousness, nama rupa, uh, consciousness, uh, mind and body, uh, uh, the six senses, contact, it's there. Like, where, whether we like it or not, it's there, that's, that's just happening all the time. That's not where we have a choice. Where we have a choice, and then sensations also. Sensations is, is there. We don't have a choice. But we have a choice after that. The choice is whether uh, what we do with our mind after we come upon sensations. So the experiences we, we come upon, then are we going to grab onto it, latch onto it, or push it away? That's our choice. Are we going to crave for something else or be okay with what is and be at peace? So that's basically what, what the Satipatthanas are. Uh, and that's why I say it's dependent origination but without tanha, 
Upadana. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it because uh, what, ha- what happens with this is that the mind will have a tendency to cling on to the breath, basically. Um, it will try to, and that, that's one of the difficulties that one can encounter by doing this practice, is that mind will try to stay with the breath, basically, and that's not the point of the practice. The point of the practice is just, it's not about the breath, it's to practice each of those steps, basically. The breath doesn't really matter. And what most people will do is that they put their attention on the breath and then, and then dive deeper into that and then try to control the breath and then try, try to do these steps with the breath where the Buddha is only just saying that as you know, a, a time stamp, a time marker. Just do that every breath. Just, just, you breathe in, breathe out, you just do this. Smile, relax, smile, relax. <laughs> yes, okay, good. Yes. After having done very famous meditation, if we go to do this anatta, yes. uh, I think it would have to reinforce very famous also. So I really wonder if we could have some instructions from the some guided kind of thing. Yes. Yes, I've guided uh, I've guided a few anapana meditations uh, in the past. Uh, like I said, mostly for people that were uh, having a really hard time uh, with any of the other uh, paths that we recommend. But anapana sati is something that um, I do. Um, I would see uh, as a very valid practice if, if understood and practiced properly um, after somebody has experienced basically uh, uh, Niroda for, for the first time or like has experienced that, that level of release and then basically the practice becomes like Anapanasati. It's, it's basically, it becomes kind of more and more integrated like that. Whether there is love, love and kindness or not, uh, the joy, you know, one understands. That's why I get everybody to repeat these words every morning, is because that's how the mind gets collected with the joy and the letting go. And as you breathe in and out, I mean, this is awareness of the body. This is one of the satipatthanas. Even if we didn't want to be aware of body, we couldn't. <laughs> and when the mind is very clear and calm, it will just notice that there is breathing, basically. That's, that's all it is. And then it will enjoy the release process and then go deeper into, yeah. And just making sure there's that joy still there all the time, that will make sure that the direction is, um, uh, we're keeping the right direction. So that um, uh, it doesn't become dry, because when the joy is gone, then that's when we try to force our experience to get back somewhere that we were. But we forget that the joy is what got us there, basically. Uh, but yeah, in the advanced practice, I, I would totally uh, um, think that the Anapanasati practice is a valid practice as a advanced meditation. Although, uh, I mean, the Brahma Viharas are just an amazing vehicle uh, altogether uh, that will bring people there much faster anyways, so... Uh, but yeah, to, to me, it's fine. <laughs> I know some other people would say other things, but... <laughs> Two other questions. One is that uh, <coughs> this <is> close. Yes. <coughs> was the best kind of the place to be, huh? according to the Buddha. So the 
Yes. Yes. Oh, you mean in like a day-to-day -day life, basically? Mm. Um, personally, I, I have my doubts that uh, one could live a functional life in either perception or not perception. I think... Oh, in sitting? Yes, oh, okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, Sitting, yes. So basically, the, in, in another sutta, the Buddha says that uh, neither perception or non-perception is like the, the, best, the best object of clinging, basically. Uh, to Ananda, he says, uh, well, the, Ananda says, uh, but Bhante, this must be the best object of clinging, that is neither perception or non-perception. And he says, that is true, Venerable Ananda. <laughs> it is the best object of clinging, the highest object of clinging. Uh, but there's still clinging in it to awareness, to the, to the neither perception nor non-perception. You've never driven a car in neither perception or non-perception? I've never driven a car in neither perception or non-perception. <laughs> Thankfully. I can just uh, imagine you breaking a red signal while driving a car and telling the police in that story I was in neither perception. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Good luck getting yourself out of it. <laughs> I neither perceive the red light nor not perceive it. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's basically like uh, if you go on a trip and uh, you don't have a road map. Uh, you still can make it there and you can enjoy the scenery, but uh, it's nice to have a road map because then you know, okay, we're meant to go here. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, 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 so, I mean, we're all aspiring, sorry, <laughs> so, uh, in Buddhism, that's another, that's another question that I had, uh, because I was being told to uh, stay equanimous so much, uh, <laughs> became like a zombie, <laughs> But um, there is a thing that we call chanda in Buddhism. And chanda is wholesome desire. Chanda, yes. And that is a word that comes in each and every step of right effort, basically. It comes in uh, chandang janeti, viriyang arabati. Uh, I can't, it's, it's in the book. But... Um, so we have to arise, arouse that desire. You know, we're, if we're all here, is that because we, we desire liberation, we desire the happiness of, of freedom, of mental development, because we believe that is a good thing. And so we're all here because of chanda, basically. And that is not, yes, it is a kind of craving, but I mean, we need that <laughs> if there's no, if there's no wanting intention towards, you know, these wholesome states, then we can't develop them. Ananda said uh, in one of the suttas, it's like somebody uh, goes from, um, 
from one city to the next with with a car and uh, when they when they arrive uh, when they arrive at the city they don't need the car anymore they just leave it there because they're arrived they don't need it anymore but to go there we need it so we need we need the vehicle Yes. Yeah, I. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, this is a fairly advanced teaching, you know, uh, letting go of the raft, basically. Um, and personally, I've seen this a little, unfortunately, too many times where people try to let go of the raft, but they're still like, they haven't even left the first shore, you know? Like, so <laughs> it's like. <laughs> You know, you have to be skillful, you know, you need the raft, like you still have to cross with the raft. And that's when you're on the other side, or really close to the other side, that you can be like, okay, now it's time to let go of the raft. Now it's kind of impeding me. Uh, so this loving kindness that we're talking about, yes. and then talk of hindrances, to yeah. the moment I want to, for example, do something or do the next task, or, in, or I'm, I'm hungry, I'm thinking of lunch, for example. Yes. Yes. But as a householder, like the, the world is full of hindrances only. Yes. So then, uh, uh, and then, uh, and then, so it's a lot of balancing and a lot of, you know, I, I envy your position, let me say it. I envy your position is because you probably have the families to be here and do this. And uh, because we feel very limited sometimes. Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't know what to say. He <laughs> gave a lot of uh, advice to, for lay people. A lot of his uh, discourses, like uh, Digging the Kaya 31, is uh, just solely directed at, at uh, lay people, and there's a lot of great advice in there. And But it's basically what you're practicing here in a sense of cultivating wholesome qualities and being virtuous and being mindful and paying attention to where you're paying attention, where your mind is all the time. You can do all those things and there's people in this tradition who are lay people. I mean, almost everyone in this tradition is a lay person besides like a handful of us. <laughs> but, I mean, I can count on less than a hand. But uh, they've made like incredible progress and they just commit to maybe one retreat a year and then like have a very dedicated uh, home practice of you know two hours a day or more and then just stay very mindful and make it a basically make it a priority and uh, then all these things have been possible for them the thing with uh, wholesome mental development, which is what we're practicing here with loving kindness, the Brahma Viharas, the six R's, um, for me that's something that I noticed in my previous practices. Like um, these practices were really hard to integrate into my life. I would uh, sit a ten-day course because I was doing a, I was a long-term server at a vipassana center, and I would sit for 10 days and then I would go back into the kitchen because I was kitchen manager we were cooking for 200 people and uh, in one day it was all gone and it was really hard to maintain that kind of awareness because it was you know it was forced and it's like you're looking at your nostrils or you're looking at your sensations but it's it's hard to do other things when you're doing that because everything becomes a hindrance like you're saying right it's like 
anybody that's going to come at you is going to like come and disturb you basically and is going to come and knock you off your samadhi or your concentration and it was always this like really strong push and pull push and pull and like the whole world was like a fight basically and i was not really happy <laughs> and i was getting impatient and and all that but with this practice is very very different loving kindness you can do that with everything that you're doing you can smile all the time when you understand the sequence of natural samadhi of natural collectedness of mind with joy and relaxing and letting go you can tap into that when you're cooking chopping cucumbers and like cooking nice dal and like putting all your whole love into it and it's actually really like so much easier to merge the practice into life and like i would say like for me it was like a 95% difference like completely because then because then the love like as soon as the love is in your heart and then there's the joy and then the mind gets really collected you can maintain that like in in many ways and then it's going to help not only you but like your relationships everything that you're doing and it's going to come back at you and so you're becoming a generator of that which will also come back to you so it's a, it's just like a night and day difference in between these practices um that i have noticed i mean this is my personal experience uh, you have to experience your own life but uh, that's all i can say <laughs> mm. I mean, I have people, um, uh, some students in Canada that, you know, um, they're just, uh, I don't know, just like uh, cooking and they're just like having a time, you know, and they're still meditating and they're uh, doing all these things, but uh, samadhi doesn't get knocked off because they have enough discernment. They have enough wisdom to know these are mental states, which one to choose, which one to let go, and the samadhi of the mental collectedness of the mind it just remains basically as as you go. And of course, maintaining a steady meditation practice will give you the foundation you need to remain aware of that throughout the life, throughout your daily waking life. TK. Sabat chahi. Okay, yes. I think uh, I think what I gathered from this conversation, uh, the point she was making for myself is uh, I think she uh, got very important because she got is the foundation. Yes. For yes. So if I'm not keeping my shiga. Practice. Samadhi is going to be hard because so it's not going to be authentic. Yes. Right? So, my, my, my wondering, the same question she had, um, has always been this how to live an authentic life. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if something doesn't work for me, but I have to do it out of obligation, so it's usually that called uh, no pain, no gain. <laughs> <laughs> Which is yeah. what Yes. Because it's such an old tradition, right? Yes. Like you just focus and you do your work and uh -huh. you go through pain. But it seems there's no joy in the game. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if, you, if you have Sheila uh -huh. and you're cultivating joy, then I think what it allows me to be is okay. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing something which I don't want to do, then I can just stop doing it. That's yes, yes. I mean, Sheila is. I, I, I didn't talk about virtue, but <laughs> virtue basically. These are the precepts we take. Yeah. But I'm saying that the fear of the, the hindrance, the fear as a hindrance here, for me was all consuming because I never saw it as hindrance, I saw it as me. Mm. So yes. I couldn't give it up. Yes. 
identity. The problem with identity. Mm. No. So. Yes. With is a hindrance. <laughs> no self, no problem. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, yes, I know, huh? The bills, they'll catch you right at the end. <laughs> yep, I know, we were just talking about that. Neither perception and non perception, and then you get like, oh, right, I have to pay this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. TK, let's share our merits. Oh, yes. Uh, what is exactly this Mahasi stack you just spoke about? Is it the same as that going to the Vipassana? And uh, the other thing is that we also need to give it to a little bit of light on the other Buddhist uh, traditions, like if, for example, you know, what is exactly Mahayana and Vajrayana? Uh, mm. uh, because, you know, like, from what I've seen, they seem to be doing very, very different things. Yes. Uh, like if you look at what, what happens at the Zen, Zen group is yeah, oh. Yes. And uh, one of the things I read is that the word Zen comes from Zana. But uh, it's, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, the things that they are doing don't seem to be matching at all. I've explored the major traditions, and uh, so I can give like a brief summary, which is just just my opinion, and I hope not offensive to anyone. Maybe you can correct me if I say if I misspeak. But uh, so just to give a brief overview, there's you know there's Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. So within Theravada, which is our tradition technically, although Bhante would say that he was Suttavada because even he didn't like being associated with Theravada because it was mostly working from the commentaries. Um, within Theravada, there's many different techniques. So the one that Bhante had mentioned, the Mahasi style noting, comes from Mahasi side out, and this, is, this involves focusing and doing Vipassana on, in other words, focusing your attention on the minute sensations and uh, basically anything happening in your experience, you're noting it. And you might even, in the beginning, put a label on it, like hearing, tasting, seeing, feeling. And that's just a very brief summary of that method. But there's, within Theravada, there's many different methods that can lead, uh, or reportedly lead to awakening, but focusing on your breath is another whole thing. So that's, the Theravada tradition is saying, we're, we're directly descended from the Buddha, that's their claim. Mahayana is saying we're like the next turning of the wheel. Because some people are saying there's three turnings of the wheel and now there's an evolution in how we understand the Buddha's teaching and we should cultivate what's called bodhicitta, which is compassion for all beings. and the aspiration went from becoming an arhat and basically getting off the wheel of samsara to now taking the bodhisattva vow and saying we're going to stay in samsara for the benefit of all beings and aspire to be buddhas ourselves however long that may take and continue to develop and cultivate the mind and the techniques and within Mahayana that includes Zen and that includes part of Tibetan Buddhist practice as well but uh, the Techniques themselves uh, differ a bit, but also have some similarities. So they might follow the breath. There's still cultivation of wholesome qualities. There's still, um, you know, uh, sitting and walking practice. There's many, many similarities, but the view itself is different because now it's more about becoming a Buddha over a long period of time. And then the Vajrayana tradition incorporates, takes that as well, the bodhicitta, and what they call, well, within Vajrayana there's many, many different subsects, but there's uh, what's called Buddha nature, which is the idea that you can 
basically within you is already the, the seeds of a Buddha and you just need to recognize that. And there's many different techniques for awakening and becoming a Buddha in this tradition and they include a lot of energy practices because it merged with a lot of the yoga and uh, tantric practices which include um, a lot of these kundalini practices, cave yogi practices. Uh, it's a real eclectic tradition. There's many, many, like thousands of techniques and sutras and all these things. So they would say that this is an evolution, of, a further evolution of the Buddha's teaching. That's that's the perspective, and. Uh, they would also refer to Theravada as Hinayana as the lesser vehicle, or as Vajrayana means the diamond vehicle, and Mahayana means the greater vehicle. Whereas the Theravada tradition would say that, well, the general perspective would be that Buddhism is getting watered down, actually, and that the original discourses and suttas are closer to what he actually taught. So those are just, there's many different views, and there's many different ways to see it. You could also just say, like, hey, whatever leads to awakening is all good. You could say, well, does it mean, could they all lead to the same awakening? And uh, uh, is the view really all that important? And uh, so some teachers emphasize the similarities that, hey, let's be all inclusive here. And then other teachers say there's actually some key differences and we need to be very careful about what's being practiced because you can easily get sidetracked and have a wrong view uh, or end up in a very different place than where the Buddha was trying to lead us and stay on the wheel of samsara for a long time. So that's, I try to give an, an unbiased perspective. Those are, that's an overview of these different traditions. It would be nice to maybe link up uh, this practice and um, Mahamudra and uh, Rigpa. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because the, one of the things that I realized uh, through trying these different techniques is that this practice is actually closer to a lot of the Tibetan Buddhist practices than it is to actual Theravada uh, one-pointed concentration. Um, and they have one-pointed con concentration in the Tibetan tradition as well, but they also emphasize a very open awareness and there's a, there's a map, or there's a, uh, I, I guess I'll call it a technique called Mahamudra, where, which means uh, the great seal. And you're progressively first, first concentrating the mind, so that part's not quite the same. But then you're slowly opening up and relaxing your awareness. And if you look at that map, um, that map of how the mind progressively relaxes, it maps on very closely to the jhanas, at least all the way to the seventh jhana. But then it kind of stops there at this uh, pure awareness, this awareness that's cleaned up from craving and it's very blissful. And then basically tells you to rest in that and then that is rigpa, that is Buddha nature, that is the end of the spiritual journey. Now I'm putting in my own interpretation. Uh, and that is Dzogchen as well. And Dzogchen also gets you to that pure awareness, pure consciousness mind through a more direct means because a skilled teacher will point out that that clear mind is already here right now and if you just kind of shift your attention in just the right way, uh, sometimes after years of preliminary practices, a uh, skilled teacher can get you to recognize Rigpa that clear, clear mind, and then your task becomes to re-recognize over and over again. Uh, and interestingly, in, in the Dzogchen tradition, they do use sometimes like three of the R's, like recognize, release, re uh, recognize, rela relax, remain, or something quite similar, because you're just learning to kind of unhook awareness and drop back into this very open, uh, pure, uh, clear mind. So but there's no, there's no Neroda. Sadhu, sadhu. I like to, if we're going to talk about different traditions, I like to uh, at least connect the similarities that we might have so that it's not just about 
yeah, like this, yeah. but it's, it can be somewhat. Yeah, and I think that a lot of these other practices are like quite complementary, especially mm -hmm. learning to open up awareness like Dzogchen. Even there's a very experienced uh, twin practitioner who just did a Dzogchen tech, uh, retreat because they were quite curious and hmm. I don't know how that went for them, but it's, I think it's quite compatible. It's just the, it's just like, if you, if you start going into a different tradition, you might find that the, the language and the view, it, it can get very confusing for the mind because there's so many different, as Bhante says, there's so many different things you can do with your mind. And so my general recommendation would be to just stick with one practice at least for a time until you feel like you've really got the hang of it. And then you could safely explore other things without confusing yourself or wondering what's, you know, actually, what's actually going on here. TK. So let's share our merits. Thank you. Yeah, I hope I didn't uh, over over speak. No, no, yeah. no. I I like to have this. Uh, it's nice. Oops. Rejoicing in the merits two thirteen. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Okay, on this, have a beautiful evening, night. Keep smiling. And I'll see you tomorrow.